You are listening to the Tri Order Transmissions Episode 36. And now, here are Craig and Jeff. Hello and welcome back to the Tricorder Transmissions. As always, this is Craig Cohen. And Jeff Hewlett. And this week, Jeff, we are going to take a look at the episode's Cat's Paw. Did you just snicker? <laughs> I tried to make it suspenseful for some silly reason. Oh. I guess it fits with the theme of that this that episode, though. Yeah, it is kind of a, a whimsical episode, I suppose. Yes, yes. But I guess, as always, before we get to that, we'll have some uh, Star Trek-related news to discuss. Sure, sure. So a couple things. First thing is there is a what they're calling a Star Trek Live in Concert series beginning pretty soon in May, which is not too far from now. It's actually starting in, the, in Europe, in the UK and Switzerland. And then coming to the, the U.S. for a few dates, One, the only one close to us, Craig, is in Philadelphia at the Mann Center. Okay, I saw Steely Dan there back in the fall. Yeah, I've been there a couple times myself. It's, it's a nice place. Yeah. yeah. A nice beer garden there. Oh, yeah. So it seems like they're going in the same direction that the uh, Lord of the Rings movies they did a couple of years ago. What they did was they took the movie and put it on a screen and then put a live orchestra in front of it and played the score over the film as it played. So you were hearing the music done live. So let's do the same thing with uh, Into Darkness and the 2009 uh, Star Trek reboot film. Wow, so that'll be a long a long uh, program. Uh, looks like it. So in the Philadelphia one, for example, they're doing Into Darkness that night. That's really our only choice if we were to go to that. That's on July 31st. Oh, we're going to be at the convention. Yeah, and it's funny because I know at the convention there's going to be some kind of concert event uh, built around some music being recreated, but I haven't really looked too much at that, uh, at what that program is going to entail. But that's pretty neat. You know, anytime uh, people have a chance to go out there and hear uh, the music from a movie isolated, and and performed live is 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 pretty neat. I know you've uh, gone to a couple of different ones for that, and I know uh, one of the special features on DVDs that I used to love that seem to have been going away is the isolated score track, which uh, really allows you to hear how the music really works with the rest of the film. Yeah, absolutely. If you're a fan of scores, that's a really great thing to have. But I saw all three of the Lord of the Rings movies. Uh, done that way. So he had the Fellowship of the Ring, the Two Towers, and Return of the King. And they were all just spectacular. They had the actual voice choirs there and the soloists and a huge, huge orchestra. And I caught myself so many times watching the actual movie and not focusing enough on the music and I would feel guilty and I'd focus <laughs> like, back on the music, right? Yeah, you're like, that's what I paid for. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but it sounds so great. And yeah, any chance to hear a live orchestra today for me is, is a huge, huge treat. It just doesn't happen often enough. Well, that's right. really neat. And I guess we'll, re we'll report it on it when it gets closer to it. And, uh, you know, hopefully um, the experience um, that they're creating – at the convention in Vegas will uh, will be enough to uh, whet our appetite, if you will. Yeah, I, if we were in town, I probably would have uh, bit the bullet and gone to this just to just to hear the orchestra. But so moving on, a little bit of real life news. Seems like last Saturday the USS. I hope I'm saying this right. The USS Zumwalt. Uh, Sounds good to me. Yeah, Z U M W A L T. It's a ship, and it was captained by the real-life James Kirk. <laughs> uh, it was actually commissioned last Saturday, and William Shatner, 
our beloved Captain Kirk was unable to attend, but he sent the real life Captain Kirk a little letter to apologize for not being able to be there. I, I thought that would have been really cool if the if Captain Kirk was standing next to Captain Kirk at the commissioning of this thing. Yeah, that would have been really cool. But you know what? Sending a letter is, is pretty neat. That's a nice uh a nice gesture. Yeah, there's a, a signed photo of Shatner and the letter that went with it. So that's kind of cool that uh, he acknowledged that the real life Captain Kirk is actually captaining a vessel. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, it's pretty neat. So that about wraps up the news section of the show. So you want to get ready to jump into our scene specific commentary? Uh, you know it. All right. So the air date for the original version of Cat's Paw was October 27th of 1967, hauntingly close to Halloween, I might add. Yes. And the remastered version came out on October 28th of 2006, again, hauntingly close to Halloween. Mm -hmm. And I've got the write-up from the October 21st, 1967 issue of TV Guide. Castles, dungeons, witches, and black cats pervade this episode as Kirk seeks a rational explanation of an escape from the alien forces that have lured him to Pyrus 7. It's a dark, forbidding planet devoid of life, at least as Earthlings know it. Script by Robert Bloch. Wow, that's longer than normal. Yeah, yeah, I guess they they really decided to do it up. Yeah, gave cats poor the treatment. So, all right, let's get started with our scene-specific commentary in three... Two, one. So um, I know in the intro you mentioned the proximity to Halloween. Mm -hmm. And even though this was um, produced pretty early in the season, um, at some point it was decided that Star Trek was going to have a quote unquote Halloween episode. Yeah. So, so this one was earmarked for that slot, which really sort of puts this episode into a new light for me. Yeah, it does. It's funny because. This is one of those uh, cocktail party type things. And I've talked about this episode with a lot of people, and some sometimes people think that it was unintentionally a Halloween episode, and sometimes they know the actual history, and they're like, yeah, this was the actual quote-unquote Halloween holiday episode. So uh, it is, in fact, written and produced to be a Halloween episode. In fact, cause it was the first episode, I believe, that was produced in season two. It was darn close because this is the first episode with Chekhov right. um, from a production standpoint, and that's why he's going to have the uh, the wig that we all uh, know and love. Yeah, so they held it off uh, until the week of Halloween, mm-hmm. so it definitely was intended to be a Halloween episode. Yes, and in Robert Bloch's original script, um, this character that just fell off the transporter Ooh. and died was written as Sulu. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was a hell of a fall that oh, guy just took. Tremendous fall. Great stunt work. Yeah. And I guess the producers looked at the script and said, well, we're not killing off Sulu, and that character doesn't come back to life. Yeah, so, really. Uh, <laughs> it just shows, I guess, when you bring in outside writers, um, either uh, Blotch didn't really know um, how important Sulu was, or... Um, Thought it would be cool to kill him off, but I'm yeah. sure to much to George Takai's, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, surprise um, or joy, he wasn't killed off. Yeah, thank God. So I'm tired of seeing the characters killed off and brought back immediately in the same yeah. episode. Yeah. And actually, there is a deleted sequence script wise oh. um, that actually explains how that crew member died. And uh, without explanation, um, why? Uh, McCoy's diagnosis is that he froze to death. Hmm. Yeah. So well, that uh, would kill anybody, I guess. Yeah. All right. So we already mentioned that Robert Bloch uh, wrote this episode. He also wrote, as we know and love, the episode "What Are Little Girls Made Of?" Yes, sir. And he also wrote the novel "Psycho," uh, in addition to dozens of other novels. And we might as well talk about the director while we're talking about behind the scenes stuff. It's Joseph sure. Pevney who, you know, directed 14 episodes of the series total. Previously saw him this season on The Apple, and we're next going to see his directing work on The Journey to Babel. Oh, all right. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. So we just got through the stinger, getting the title, Cat's Paw, written by Robert Block. Mm -hmm. Uh, The remaster has a much cooler-looking planet. Yeah. I like that cracked uh, surface look. 
Yeah, that's the first thing I really noticed as I was like, wow, the, those flyby scenes look even better than they normally do in the remastered uh, episodes. So uh, it's it's kind of funny that you picked that out as well. Yeah. And, you know, here we are in obviously an indoor set with uh, some rocks. Yeah. Some sort of rocks. And uh, they're, you know, this is the fun. Another funny thing about these episodes, you know. We're we're pretty solidified here, cast wise, and you know this guy just beams back from the planet dead. So the three top <laughs> guys in the ship beam down without security. Yeah, and with with uh, their chief engineer um, already down on the planet. Yeah, I mean, who normally sits in for Kirk when he's not there? If if Kirk and Spock are gone, it just seems so insecure to have all three. Wouldn't they beam down a security detail to check stuff out first? Yeah, well, especially because at this point, what um, Sulu and and Scott have uh, they're not even getting readings from them anymore. Yeah, right? they've they've, yeah. they've essentially vanished. Look at that smoke work. That with yeah. the, the smoke. that's really great. That they can have that low lying smoke there. That doesn't yeah. really permeate too much up. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I wonder if that involved uh, fans when they weren't shooting or something to, to keep it down. Keep it Who down, knows? Yeah. Oh, we've got some life forms. Sp- See how Spock's holding the tricorder the right way? Yeah. <laughs> we leave it to Spock. So he knows how to use that thing. Yeah. So kind of strange landscape. I guess it's kind of... Oh, and here is this red shirt guy who has been left in charge. And our first shot of Sulu, I mean, <laughs> Sulu Jekov, with his huge Davy Jones wig on. Yeah. So this was his first produced episode, and the wig is ridiculous. Yeah, that must have been jarring, considering that the previous episode we saw him on, he um, he had his his normal hair. That's right. Um, this That's other crew right. member though is uh, billed as Desal, Lieutenant mm-hmm. Desal. Yep. That's Michael Barrier, and he actually appears on two other episodes, uh, The Squire of Gothos, and This Side of Paradise, and uh, he seems to have a slightly different job role. Um, on each episode yeah in so, this uh, one he's pretty well trusted because he's in command of the ship isn't he yeah he's what like second in command to scotty in terms of the engineering crew yeah so now he's actually left in the captain's chair on the enterprise and the funny thing is he's left there kind of you would think there'd be other people who are still on the ship who who outrank him yeah but uh, apparently not i guess because sulu uh, is lost and Scotty is lost. I, I wonder if there's some sort of a, a a rank chart that we could look up somewhere that would tell us who's officially where on the rankings. I mean, we, I'm sure there is, and I actually I wish that uh, either Vernon was with us yeah. or uh, <laughs> or even some of our listeners out there I know yeah. would probably uh, probably have this committed to memory. And now here we get one of the um, Halloween type moments from this episode where we have. Yeah. Um, these like witches. Yeah, these are um, kind of hokey looking to me. <laughs> this is one of those spots where I wish they had done some remastered effects on them. Oh my god, that would have been really neat. This long shot here looks pretty cool though, where they're just floating. Yep, yep. It's not really until the close ups that things start to look a little questionable for me. See, now I'm I'm looking at this episode with subtitles on, and it actually just said male witch. Yeah, I, I thought one of the voices sounded male, and I wasn't sure if it was just a guy doing the the voiceover or if it was supposed to be a male character. I, I, I also thought a male witch was called a warlock, but <laughs> that's just me. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong on that one. No, no, you're very right. They uh, they made a whole oh, look at the of eyebrow. Movie. Yeah. Did you see that gigantic eyebrow? Look at the one in the middle. You can see him really well. Yeah. Talk about some spirit gum. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're basically. Um, warning them uh that that uh there's a, a curse <laughs> yeah it's Sp- kirk asked spock for comment and spock says very bad poetry oh, it's good so typical spock yeah. it's great reaction yeah and i just want to point out here before it actually make makes its uh its its appearance that my cat um elliot has decided to perch on the bed in front of my monitor and we see we were talking about having cats with us when we did this episode. Yeah, and normally he doesn't hang around. Sometimes he'll come in and sit on my lap or or whatnot. But tonight he's decided to sit in front of the monitor, and Very I will uh, I'll snap a picture of it um, that we can maybe put up uh, somewhere. Yeah, I have opted not to let my cats in the room because I just didn't know how much noise they were going to make. But uh, maybe I could get up and open the door real quick. <laughs> Man, maybe I won't. 
<laughs> one cat's enough, right? Well, you can't keep. We have three, and you you can't let one in and not the others. That would be disastrous. Oh, sure. So, all right. Oh, well, look at Kirk's hair got messed up in that wind. And is that one of the only times we've ever seen Kirk's hair really get messed up? I think so. Usually, it's perfect. Well, I guess even Kirk is fallible. <laughs> oh, it settled back down a little bit. This must have been a different take. He yeah. must have fixed his hair between takes. Oh, and did they do the remastered? Did they do a remastered castle? Or is you know that what? the actual I, castle? I didn't go and A-B it. I, I have to do that. Because I don't yeah. I don't recall. I don't think I've seen the non-remastered version of this since I was a kid. Yeah, this was one of those episodes that I, um, as I sat down to watch it for this episode, I said, this is one of those Trek episodes that I've seen exactly once. And it was probably sometime in the mid 90s. I've probably seen this. I want to say about at least two to three times. Uh, once was in the when I originally got the Blu-ray set and I watched every episode. Uh, in, I remember in, you tweeting all those. I used to follow your uh, your tweets as you went. Oh, through yeah, the I was live series. tweeting that, wasn't I? Yeah, it was great. I really should go back and, and pull those out. I think you can download all that stuff. I think if nothing else, you can record. You can request an archive. Yeah, yeah, I should do that and see if I could get all a copy of all my. I think I live tweeted just about every episode I watched. Yeah, I remember you know it popping up you know on random days. I would have up oh, Jeff's watching uh watching some Star Trek. Oh, I binged big. There were nights I watched three or four episodes in a row. Yeah, and you know what's funny is that uh, tweeting experience probably indirectly led to us getting together to actually do the tricorder transmission it certainly did and it also brought a couple of people into my regular followers list that i interact with on a regular basis now oh that's awesome so yeah a couple of people had started to respond to my my tweets and i you know followed them and they followed me and it was pretty cool ah sweet. so more more friends in trek out there <laughs> yeah and now the smoke has gotten pretty heavy yeah and they're, they're approaching the open door to go into this quite interesting looking castle uh oh, yeah. there's that big, there's that black cat. Yeah. Now that is not a happy cat. I that, that I wonder if they tra was that a trained cat. I'd imagine at that point there had to be some kind of Hollywood uh, based um, animal provider. I'm sure. You know, you know, I'm like sure. you know, pets of Hollywood or something like that. Look whatever. At, do you look at the look on Kirk's face? He's totally not buying into any of this. Like, Get the <laughs> hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> He's yeah, a totally and, and nonchalant. He said, yeah, and he references it's it feels like somebody's playing a trick, trick or, treat or treat on them. Oh now they have to explain yeah. trick or treating to Spock because of course Volk is you know, he's very well versed in human history, but he doesn't know about Halloween. Yeah, yeah. And it got me thinking because I said, you know what? Um even from um in our lifetime, um Halloween is sort of really um, changed a lot in mm -hmm. terms of how visible it is. Oh, big time. Um, I mean, when we were younger uh, in the, what, the late 70s and the 80s, um, we actually used to go door-to-door -door trick or treating. Yes. Um, you know, you see that scene in like E.T. where the, you know, the entire um, town mm -hmm. is, you know, just, you know, lining the sidewalks and in basically in the middle of the road. That's you know, what it's it like used Halloween to be like. takes over. And now it's very, very rare, uh, at least in my area. Um, yeah. I don't even buy candy anymore. Yeah, I don't either. We don't get any trick-or-treaters here. When I was a kid, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, we would walk and we'd steal our parents' pillowcases. Mom would get really mad to steal her pillowcase because <laughs> you could fit more candy. So, yeah. And you would go for I – mean, you could go a half a mile, a mile away from your house. Oh, yeah. And it was not a problem. And now it's like they take the kids to the mall and they trick-or-treat in stores. Yeah. You know, it's a shame that the, the experience has kind of gotten it's but it's it's more commercial now though than it used to be too. Yeah, and now it's just That's an excuse different. really for adults to dress up in silly or sexy costumes. Yeah. I say we try a, a new Halloween tradition and on every Halloween we watch Cat's Paw. I'm game. All right, me too. I know that's right around your birthday too. So Halloween uh, is my birthday. So. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah, it could be a a a a, a birthday uh Halloween celebration. And this actually this this recording is a celebration of your birthday, which happened recently. So Cat's Paw is your birthday too. Wow, isn't that convenient? Look at that. <laughs> Amazing. So anyway, back to this episode. So more cat. Uh oh. Yeah, the and cat they've been has... lured into a trap where they've fallen through the floor. Yeah. 
And as a cat owner, I can say it's not that out of the realm of possibility that um, a cat could lure you into a trap like Oh, absolutely. That. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm constantly lured into cat traps where they jump out and, <laughs> and jump on my legs as I'm walking by. Yeah. Oh, look, a dungeon. Yeah, I, I mean, this is uh, some of the stuff that I really, really enjoy in this episode is just some of the visuals that you – would never expect to see in a Star Trek episode. No. Um, and also just sort of how the images work with each other. You have this like medieval, almost castle dungeon setting, but then you've got guys in Starfleet uniforms. Yeah. And, and obviously a plastic skeleton hanging yes. there, which, you know, they, they went really over and above what I think with some of these set pieces, like this dungeon looks really good. Yeah. But then they hang like an obviously fake looking skeleton in there. It kind of takes you out of the experience in a way. Mm -hmm. But it is kind of cool to see Kirk and Spock chained up in a dungeon there. And Spock, you would think Spock might be strong enough to pull the chains out of the wall. Yeah. You know, he but, is pretty strong. Yeah, but Spock almost seems like he may be the type of guy that's like, you know what? I'm not going to do that until I have a, a, a better handle on the situation. Hmm. I'm just giving him the benefit of the doubt from a logic standpoint. <laughs> yeah, so speaking of logic, now they're kind of reasoning out that uh, the, these images that they're seeing or these realities that they've been put into are straight out of the uh, human fears and the human psyche. So mm -hmm. someone has been crafting this based on the the, the common fears of human beings. Yes. And now enter... Scotty and Sulu, obviously not in control of their own faculties. Yes, and in fact, sometimes even referred to as zombies. Oh, how at Halloween. In, <laughs> at least in some of the stuff that I read leading up to this episode. I mean, uh, in terms of the, the Hollywood technical term, they are not the undead, but uh, they are very zombie-like. Yes, and speaking of zombie-like, Sulu actually has no dialogue. Yeah, in this and, episode. and what Scotty has one line. I think one line, but it's not really even a line. It's only a couple of words. Yeah. Well, one thing I had read uh, regarding this is in the original script, those were just two random crew members. And uh, it was suggested that they use um, Scotty and Sulu since they ha they weren't really utilized much in the episode. Ah. Um, but you'd assume that Scotty would have been playing um, or handling the role that uh, DeSalle had. But... Uh, you would think. Who, who knows? Either way, I do know that Sulu, it might have been that Sulu wasn't slated for this episode at all. Mm. And um, it was suggested that since they had him on uh, as a regular cast member, um, they might as, well, uh, might as well utilize him as opposed to a, uh, you know, a random uh, extra. Um, but it's also cool because it gives, um, you know, a sense of danger to this episode because, you know, then you're going to, be sitting through this episode trying to figure out how Scotty and Sulu are going to be freed from their um, their trance. It's actually a good point. I yeah. hadn't thought about it that way. So it's nice to see that they're making good decisions about how to use the regular cast members instead of how we've seen them being cast aside for unknown <laughs> and non-reused extras who just show up and disappear. Yeah. I really like the fact that you get more screen time from Sulu and he's doing other things besides just sitting behind a console. Yeah. So it makes, makes, it makes for more cohesive watch in my opinion. Yeah. So we just had some teleportation where, um, Kirk and Spock and McCoy sort of jumped Scott and Sulu and they were transferred to this, um, this other room. Yeah. It looks like a kind of almost like a throne room. Yeah. Anyway, it's got a red carpet, and the guy is the guy sitting there, a bald dude Korob. with a beard. Cool yeah. 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 Shame, that's, shame of it. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that's actor Theo Marcus, who actually died yeah. um, in a car accident like a month after this uh, episode um, aired. Yeah, um, that's a shame. At the age of 47, and he was a TV and stage actor, and he was on uh, an episode of The Monkees, Peter Gunn, The Man yep. from Uncle, and a lot of those other – 1960s shows that we always talk about on yeah, this. Uh, I remember him on the monkeys. I was a huge, huge monkeys fan. I've seen all of the episodes many, many times, and I remembered him from the monkeys. So when I watched Cat's Paw again, and I saw him, I was like, oh, he's so familiar. 
Yeah. So always nice to see those uh, cro- actors crossing shows. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is really neat. Korob, that's a weird name. It it is. It is. Hmm. But th- so this is really where the the episode's really going to sort of kick in from a a story perspective in terms of really establishing what's going on here. Yeah, and Kirk just said mumbo jumbo. <laughs> <laughs> mumbo jumbo that's it, it, that i'm surprised that that slang terminology lasted into the future in star trek times yeah because i don't hear anybody say mumbo jumbo today in 2014 i don't, I don't think i've heard anybody say that in uh, I don't know, years well who knows maybe we're gonna bring it back with this uh with this episode all right somebody post mumbo jumbo <laughs> on our facebook page <laughs> that would be awesome yes so um Scott, uh, Spock just referenced that this section of the solar system had been mapped before, um, and this planet had no uh, readable life forms hmm. um, at that time. So now we're being, um, you know, clued in that there is definitely something uh, weird going on here. Yeah, and they're now they're they're theorizing that the cat is like a familiar, right? Yeah. So the cat is is some sort of a, a almost like a demonic companion in a way. Yeah. So uh, I will find out the truth about the cat shortly. But uh, and as you know, it's funny. This is not the only episode that has a black cat that transforms into a humanoid, is it? Oh. No, we'll see another one later on in this season, right? For uh, assignment Earth. Oh, right, yeah. With Gary okay. Seven and the Black Cat. Yeah, which was supposed to what? Be a, a spinoff. Yes, that was supposed to be a, a, a turn into a spinoff. Yeah. But I'll, ha- I'll have one of my cats with me for that one for sure. Ah, cool. That's the definitive cat episode of Star Trek, the original series, I think. Yeah, that cat gets a lot of play. Like, he's, oh, he's yeah. driving plot points. Definitely. And yeah, absolutely. And you don't really know what, what the deal is with the cat until way at the end of the episode. They hint at it and hint at it and hint at it, right? So actually, that that this black cat looks more like a almost like a Maine Coon type of black, like a long hair. Yeah, black it's, cat. It, yeah, it's it's rare. Uh, you know, the the traditional Halloween black cat is a very short haired, uh, you know, variety. Yeah, like yours and mine. I have a yeah. short haired black cat, and you have a short haired black cat. So yeah. Oh, look at this! And he's material. Oh, he materialized a plate of precious gems. Yeah, which is interesting here because Kirk pretty much spells out that they are worthless to them because they could replicate these themselves on the enterprise. Exactly. But Which, it's, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting that they still have value though, right? Well, yeah. Um, well, it almost seems like by Kirk saying they could replicate them on the enterprise that um, whatever value they have might not be in line with, you know, the value that, you know, they would hold today. Right. Or Korob th- or the value that Korob thinks they have. Exactly. And that's kind of a, uh, possibly an, an indicator as to, you know, where he's coming from. Yeah. Or it, the limits of his mind probing abilities. Oh, that's a good, that's so a good. Maybe point. what he has of humans is, is, is limited. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't know necessarily uh, some of these more deeper, uh, uh, things that that are going on in a, in a wider society. He only probed for certain information, maybe. Right. You know, just enough to create this strange castle-like area. And th- I like that wand that he has. <laughs> yes, and that that's going to play into uh, this episode very, very uh, importantly uh, towards the end. Yes, yes, it is. I, I'm. I'm fascinated by it though. It's because it's got like a kind of a black handle, but it has like a metallic end with a weird looking orb. Yeah, it, it looks almost like like some kind of technological piece on the end of it, like yeah. a mechanized something or other. Hmm. Very and interesting. Now, yeah, and now uh, the cat asks for permission to uh, to go do something, and uh, after the reveal, um, you wonder why. The cat had to ask for permission, uh, or Sylvia had to ask for <laughs> yeah. permission. I loved how Kirk stands up slowly when she walks in the room, like, hello. Yeah, yeah. So she kind of reminds me a little of Marlena. Yeah, I see that. A bit. Yeah. The hairdo is different, but uh, she kind of looks a little bit similar in the face, in a way. Yeah, yeah. This is actress 
Antoinette Bauer. Oh. Born 1932. And between um, uh, the 50s and 1992, 59 to 92, she had almost 90 TV appearances. Wow. Including The Twilight Zone, Perry Mason, Hogan's Heroes, Hawaii Five O, and um, the movie Prom Night with uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Wow. Yeah, so I thought that was pretty neat. Uh, quite an impressive career before she retired. Uh, it sounds like a, a much deserved retire- retirement in 1992. Yeah, definitely. 90, 90 appearances. That's a yeah. lot of work. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of work. That's good for her. Yeah. So pretty cool makeup job. They got like a green eye eyeshadow on her there. Yeah. So kind of make her look a little more. Uh-oh. So Spock has now wrestled a phaser from Scotty's hand, and we're going to find out that it's, of course not going to work right yeah and this story uh that robert block uh used for the episode was inspired by one of his short stories that he wrote in 1957 called um broomstick ride and this is one of the elements from that story that carried over into this episode which was kind of using um like a, you know an ob- a miniature version of an object um to cause harm on the real object hmm yeah, so uh, I thought that was pretty neat. And man, would I love to have this uh, miniature uh, Enterprise on a on a chain? Yeah, I believe that was actually donated to the Smithsonian. Yeah, by by uh, Roddenberry. Yeah, yeah. So they commissioned it for this episode specifically, and then encased it in that that clear block of like lucite, maybe. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, then they wound up donating it. So. She's going to hold it over the fire to demonstrate her power. And, of course, the people in the Enterprise are going to start roasting. So that is a really cool model. It looks like yeah. die cast, maybe. It's great. It's, it's amazing they would make a, a mold for that. Yeah. And only make one. Yeah. You know, actually, I have an Enterprise made of plastic that's about the same size as that. Oh, uh, do you? Yeah, it lights up, too. It's a little LED light inside oh, of it. Oh, that's cool. I actually, yeah. I do not have... Um... An, an enterprise uh i just have you know your you know your communicators your phasers your select you know uh different sized figures but uh yeah you know what I, i'll have to look into you know i'm sure uh at, at this convention i'll find something in the a- a- exhibitor's room yeah yeah i have a i actually have a pretty fairly large classic tos enterprise uh, on top of my computer here in my office Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and didn't you get that. um the new Enterprise uh, with the the 2009 uh, Star Trek DVD? Yes, I did. It's it's actually was a I guess I think it was the Target special edition. So it's the model of the 2009 Enterprise, and inside the saucer section is the DVD. That's awesome. The movie, yeah, it is really cool looking. Target does a lot of really cool um, exclusive stuff. They um, do. I have like an Iron Man head. Yep, I remember seeing um, that in your play. And you have a Hulk or something, too, don't yeah, you? Yeah, like Hulk breaking through a brick wall. Um, really neat. It seems like that kind of packaging isn't as uh, isn't as utilized anymore. But Yeah, I was a little disappointed that Into Darkness didn't come in a cool package like that with some sort of a model or a figure or something neat. But yeah, you thought they would have continued the trend, but instead they were like, you know what? We'll just give stores exclusive bonus features instead. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not get into that again. But. So um, I guess, you know, Kirk believes that their, uh, for lack of a better word, magic um, is powerful enough for him to uh, play by their rules. Yes. Yeah. So he's been he, he's. He understands he's not going to talk his way out of this necessarily or fight his way out of this with strength. He's got to come up with some other way to deal with this situation. You know, it just occurred to me, mm-hmm. is this the first episode that features all seven of the classic characters? Now that we have Chekhov here, is this the first one that has all seven of them in it in a, from, the, from a production standpoint? Definitely from a production standpoint, Um and I'm trying to remember the other episodes we've talked about this season. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, Uhura was missing from one of them. Uh, yep. But uh, Sulu was missing at one and point. I think Scotty, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I, I think I, so. This is definitely the first from a production standpoint, yeah. though. Mm-hmm. So oh, there's the model, the, the encased in, I guess, that's Lucite. Yeah, or, or, or um, 
you know, uh, transparent carbonite. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, bring Solo and the Wookiee to me. Oh, yeah, and boy. now we learn that the um, that is pretty much a physical representation of a, a force field that has been put around the Enterprise in space. Yeah, now we're getting acknowledgement of it by a wigged Sulu, <laughs> and he's presenting it to the Sal. So it, it just appears to have appeared around the ship, and it's not emanating from anywhere like we've seen in the past. So. Uh, you know, things emanated from the surface of a planet, you know, like the um, like the field that Apollo generated emanated from the planet. But this yeah. one is different. So it's just kind of there. So once once again, we, we're dealing with these kind of all powerful beings went back to the well again. <laughs> yeah. And it, 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 it's funny because. Even sort of how Kirk handles um, Sylvia is going to sort of, you know, be familiar to us as well in terms of how he's dealt with other, um, uh, I want to say, uh, less intellectual beings. Hey, don't you don't you think he's he's at the point where he's like, you know, been there, done that. I've been in this situation like four times, five times already. You know, you're not scaring me anymore. I've defeated. People just like you. Yeah, bring it on. You know, but Kirk seems like, uh, you know, the type of guy that's always about the chase. So, uh, you know, it almost seems like situations like this would sort of feed that, that you know, that, that you know, that side of his, uh, his personality. Mm. Now, you know, if this was a show that was being made today, this the Sal guy would be being primed for either death <laughs> or for a bigger role in the future, right? Yeah. Right? Like they're they're featuring the heck out of him and he's kind of in this heroic role where, you know, he's he's making these big decisions like, you know, hey, this if this force field exists, then we can do something about it. Yeah. Big captain kind of thing. You know, if this was made today, he'd be getting his own ship. Or uh, you know, he'd be getting bumped up to the the, the Jonathan Frakes type of position. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny. I mean, look at a, a show like CSI, w- which they spun off, or you know, NCIS. Which how many times have they spun those shows off? Where oh you God! Had, you know, uh, Tons. NCIS and then NCIS Los Angeles and you know CSI, CSI Vegas, CIS, C- CSI Miami. Yep. Um, Law and Order. Yeah, yeah c- that would have been a, one of the cool things if Star Trek, you know, existed. Um, in a time when that was prevalent, you know, how cool would it be to have like three different Star Treks on the air at the same time? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and that also kind of feeds into something that I've been saying for a while now. If they were to put Trek back on TV, it would be really awesome to have it set in the original series time frame, but just with a different ship and a different crew. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I mean, and and then at that point, the possibilities are endless. Yeah, and you could have cameos, you know, you could have Kinto show up as Spock once in a while, or I'm sure they could get the other cast members of the actual uh, reboot movies to show up. At some point, you could do a reboot, you could do a rebooted show in the in the, the new timeline. Yeah, essentially. Well, and that's funny, because, you know, you know, Marvel had such success with, uh, with their movies you know, Captain America, the Avengers, and they have that show on TV now, Agents yep. of S.H.I.E.L.D., which every once in a while, um, people from the Marvel movies, you know, cinematic universe will pop up on it. You know, not huge characters, but, uh, you know, people that have been in the movies and mm-hmm. what the, the main star of that um, is Agent Coulson, who is, uh, you know, basically in every Marvel movie up until the Avengers. So, uh, yeah, it's it's. It's always kind of sad when we we think of what could be. Yeah. Oh, they brainwashed uh, McCoy too. Yeah. And this is sort of similar to what the return of the the Archons. Yep. And, boy, and Kirk just Kirk is funny. He's just like, oh, Bones, not you too. <laughs> he's not even. It seems like he's not even taking this very seriously. Yeah. Like, oh my God. Yeah. How long do we have to endure this crap? You know. <laughs> just go punch the alien, Kirk. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Bones got he McCoy just got physical with Kirk. It was Kirk. pretty fit. Yeah. Wow. Was, you know, some good some good manhandling. Yeah, that's that's pretty aggressive for McCoy. You don't see him get into those uh situations very often. Usually if he is, he's he's out of it pretty quickly. Yeah. So now we're getting a little bit of uh turmoil between Korob and, and Sylvia. 
And we get some great dialogue from Sylvie here yes. where we get uh, the idea that um, these forms are very, very new to them. And yes. the feelings and sensations that come with those forms are new to them. And we also get a reference to uh, a callback almost to um, what are little girls made of when uh, there was just a reference to the old ones. Yes. I was just going to mention that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Cole uh, and Cole Rob is talking about they, they owe, they owe it to the old ones and they're, they're making some, he feels they're making some poor decisions. Yeah. Very strange camera angles are using on Cole Rob. This just like really tight close up. Yeah. There's a couple times they've done that. So there it is again. Yeah. It's almost like a hard POV. Yeah. Very weird. So I guess yeah. this is this is supposed to be, uh, you know, she's really in charge. Yeah, and this is the scene really where we see sort of that flip where um, we do get the the uh, you know uh, the idea that it really is her show to call. Yeah, and he's more the assistant, even though we saw him first. Yeah, and he seems to be wielding that magic wand thing, but he's not uh, he's not really calling the shots. Yeah, and then she's got to call him old man. Oh, that's is, a shame. Yeah. Well, especially considering that the body he's in is just completely uh, arbitrary. I, well, I don't know. Could he choose to look different? I mean, stands to reason if that's not – those aren't their real, real bodies. They could just kind of make themselves look like whatever. That's a pretty cool look, though. Oh, for him? Yeah. yeah. It kind of looks like a wizard. Yeah, or warlock. Yeah, pretty – yeah, good call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and here we go now. Kirk is going to teach the alien how to be a human woman. Yeah. And he, you know, he throws a, a, a slight dig at her. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, referencing that she's, uh, she's not a, a, a real woman. Mm. Um, but it seems like this form is somehow she's becoming, uh, uh, you know, engrossed, uh, with it and, uh, and almost, uh, in love with the, what that form is bringing her in terms of senses and feelings and sensations. Yeah. And it seems like it's forcing her to do things that she not, not wouldn't necessarily do in her original form. So she's having some difficulty adapting and, and maintaining control of her herself. So Kirk of course is going to use his suave. <laughs> yeah. He's just kind of, he's like, you know what, here we go. I'm just going to put, get my swerve on. So because nothing else has worked so far, right? Brute force didn't work. The phasers don't work. Yeah. And he can't he can't just get beamed out of there. So uh he's gotta turn on that old Captain Kirk charm. Yeah, and, and the interesting here thing here for me is Sylvia seems um pretty on board with uh with some of the sacrifices or trade offs that she might have to make um to retain, you know, this form. Hmm. Yeah, and well, I mean, what what's not to like? She's got this she's got this great human form she seems to like, and she's still got all of her special powers. It doesn't seem like she's really losing a heck of a lot. Yeah, yeah. But I, I guess in her in her natural state, um they're not really a, a species that wants or desires or needs or or even um experiences things um from anything but like a cerebral level. Yep, true. And well, we'll see more of that as as time goes on. Mm -hmm. But it seems like um, she's trying to kind of bribe him. Once again, we have all all of these beings seem to want to bribe the humans with, we'll give you anything you desire. I can give you anything. Apollo was, yeah, you have everything you ever wanted. You know, we'll take care of you. And she's got to do this. It's the same trope kind of thing again. And, and, uh oh, her hairstyle changed. Yeah, that's a strange looking hairdo, and her outfit changed. Yeah. That's pretty risque. Yeah, I was almost expecting her to turn green at one point. Yeah. <laughs> oh, th- th- that's not really great. <laughs> that's not great. That looks kind of like a clown now. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. That's better. Get get the black thing back on. I don't know what that 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 third outfit was supposed to mean with that white wig, but uh, yeah. she looks kind of like a clown. Yeah, well, because it was like the baggy clothes. Yeah, and she's kind of swirling around like, yeah, all right, change back, please. <laughs> I think you're going overboard with this stuff. Yeah. So. But 
and this is what I referenced earlier where, you know, Kirk is taking advantage of her, you know, or playing with her much in the same way that he played with Andrea on what are little girls made of, or, you know, the episodes where he sort of outsmarted computers. Um, you know, he's definitely taking advantage of, um, you know, her inexperience or her, uh, her lack of understanding uh, of the situation. Yeah, exactly. And I think he's using the only method available to him to yeah. get out of this scenario is his his suave. So yeah. he's actually getting some info out of her about this transducer. Yeah. So now he at least he knows there's a source of power. It's not it's not innate within them necessarily. There's a that transducer which we don't exactly know what it is yet. Uh-oh, she's yeah. on to him. Yeah. Yep, you're using me. Uh-oh, Kirk, you're in trouble now, buddy. Yeah, well, and and this is cool because this is like sort of her first taste of real like human drama. Exactly, exactly. She didn't know what to expect. Yeah, but uh, and see, Kirk's just gonna fire right back because you know they're is he, he's actually right. They're he's they're using Kirk and his crew, so why shouldn't he employ the same tactics, right? Oh, totally. Turnabout's yeah. fair play, honey. Uh oh, and she's threatening again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's not cool. <laughs> She's going to sweep their worlds away? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. They're that powerful? I don't know about that. That that seems to be a stretch. I mean, I can see how they can, they, they can affect things in a small local setting, but yeah. entire planets? Well, sometimes we say things in anger that um, we can't really deliver on. We certainly do. We certainly do. Mm-hmm. But and it seems it, another trait of all of these omnipotent powerful beings they 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 are full of threats yeah yeah and and they're also very very sort of um you know childish in their reaction when they uh you know can't get what they want exactly it's the same thing we've seen from charlie x and from trelane and apollo in a way and (sighs) Mm -hmm. and now we get a little bit more of um human drama Yep. Whereas Korob, uh, you know, overhearing everything Sylvia was saying has, uh, I guess, decided to, um, you know, throw his hat in the ring with uh, the Enterprise crew, um, I guess, because ultimately he thinks that this would lead to whatever their main objective was. Yeah. And we're getting a little bit of, of, of backstory here about what's going on with the other crew members that he he can no longer command them they actually are under sylvia's power so there's Mm -hmm. seemingly no way to break them free so we've got three major characters who are on the line at this point yeah so i guess there's some drama there i mean that seems to be pretty high stakes though oh totally three guys on the line i i don't know how you could you could think that they were gonna wipe out three characters in one shot yeah, well, you do have the strong presence of DeSalle, though. It's true. You could be like, hey, DeSalle's going to – he's going to fill the Scotty role. Yeah, he could be the new Scotty. And I guess we'll check off and he could be the new Sulu. Yeah. But what are they going to do about McCoy? Yeah, that is – Yeah, I don't know. Uh-oh, yeah. we're going to run into the giant cat again. Yeah, so Sylvia has decided, I guess, that uh, cat forms the way to go. Yeah, and it's a huge cat, too, So it's a, and it's a big shadow, though. They use the – the shadow as the uh, the representation of the large cat. Yeah, but then they do some cool like uh, rear screen or you know a projection with the with the doorway. Mm-hmm. We get some cool uh, large cat um, action. What Spock just said the cat is the most ruthless. <laughs> and that's not true. Uh, I I know. Uh, uh, Spock. Hey. Yeah. Uh, oh, see, and I told you the phasers wouldn't work. There's always a way to disable all this great technology, once again. But he said that phaser is drained. Yeah. So they drain they drain the power out of it. So like, is that the first time we we understand that a phaser can be drained of power? Oh no! Wait I, a minute, Galileo wanna, Seven. Yeah, I was gonna say there was another episode I thought where where we learned that, and uh, it was cool here how they had the cat move in slow motion um, to sort of sell the the effect that it was larger. Yeah, and they must have had a, a small tunnel built for the cat to run through. So it looked like it was running, it was bigger than it was. 
Yeah. So uh, it wasn't running through the human-sized tunnels. It was running through a miniaturized tunnel. Oh, look at this. And they're going to go back through the same hole they fell through. Yep. So, uh-oh. Oh, and the cat's coming. Yeah. So you get a little tension building here that they're being pursued by this gigantic cat. Mm-hmm. And, do you uh-oh. do you keep collars on your cats? No. Yeah. I do Neither, not. Yeah. I you know, mine doesn't have one either. And I I was wondering uh, you know, if if how how common that was. Oh, and, and boom. Corb Rob. crushed by the door. Oh man. The and cat this can't is, even fit through the door though. Yeah, and this is kind of a, a cool moment because if this was one of Kirk's crew members, um, it's undeniable that he would stay behind and find a way to get oh, him absolutely. free. But uh, here, Cora basically said, go. And Kirk was like, you don't got to tell me twice. Give me the transmuter <laughs> and uh, let's get going. But he did try to save him. Yeah, no, he did. He made a go of it. He did. But, uh, you know, you can almost wonder what would he have done if that was, you know, Scotty. Uh, yeah, he- he, well, I'm sure he would have found a way to, to pry the door off. Or he would have had Spock jump back down to help. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Oof. And Oh. Yeah, here we're going to get um, some great fighting. Yeah. Um, and McCoy some great double got, work as well. Yeah, there is. Yeah, definitely great stunt double work. But McCoy's got some sort of a mace Yeah. in his hand. So we have some, like, medieval weaponry. Oh, Scotty's got one, too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, man, did mccoy go down quick though well kirk got a good crack right in his jaw Uh oh this is some awesome um hand-to-hand stuff here and um i'm really interested in you know the the movements that sulu's making here it almost seems like a very defined fighting style yeah it's like some sort of martial art in a way like well i'm not sure exactly (laughs) what that is but (laughs) i think they're all a little bit um outside of their their normal oh. um yeah um, Kirk just strength kicked levels. the mace yeah. out of mccoy's hand yeah and sulu basically backed up and fell into that door and knocked himself out yeah pretty much so i wonder if that zombie state sort of affected your ability to stay conscious that's a good question maybe they're not in full control of their uh their faculties so they're a little bit easier to deal well spock nerve pinched scotty yeah uh, that that's the one nerve pinch rule. I wonder if you can nerve pinch the cat. I'm sure there. I'm sure you can. Hmm. I wonder if you could mind meld with the cat. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Now that would be I, pretty cool. I know it would probably be hard to keep the cat still. <laughs> well, that's probably true. He could he could nerve pinch it first. Yeah. Ah, and you know they left the transducer behind. They're lucky that didn't fall through the hole again during now, the scuffle. Has- has Spock ever uh, mind melded with an unconscious um, being? That's a good question. I don't think so. Yeah, I Not wonder if I he could. Hmm. I wonder. Yeah, that's a good question. If you have to be conscious or not? Because hmm. it seems like he, you know, he explains what's going on uh, some of the times when he when he's mind melding. Well, if he can mind meld with a robot, yeah. robots aren't conscious beings. Yeah, they're just ones and zeros. Yeah. Uh oh. The so we cat get the vanished. Yeah, we get the final Sylvia reveal for the uh for the uh the climax of the episode. Oh, and Spock Spock calls her out and he says she's he knows she's trying to get the wand back. Yeah, uh, she's trying to, you know, uh um I guess um, you know, play some some tricks of her own after being used by Kirk earlier. Yeah, and I get well, I I assume that we now are are getting the idea that she needs that transducer that wand yeah for something obviously she has powers without it oh and she's telling her he doesn't know how to use it so she's making a last ditch effort to sway kirk to come with her where we don't know but mm-hmm. and they yeah that they they need they need what's in kirk's head yeah to be more than i guess what they are mm-hmm. now they're getting addicted to or she's getting addicted to it yeah Wow, she's really getting risque there with Kirk. Yeah, down on, you know. That was a little bit strange. It, it was. Uh, you ask for love, but return pain instead. Mm. Kirk making his little speech. Oh, and she's got the drop on him with a phaser. Yeah. But, mm. boom. Oh, 
he broke the transducer. <laughs> like, what else could he do at that point? It was yeah. a gamble, calculated risk, I guess. Yeah. But now we're back outside. Smoke's gone. And everybody looks like they're in their normal state. Yeah, and it looks like we can see some sort of a blue wall in the background there. I guess it's supposed to be the sky, but... Yeah. And hey, look, it was Star Trek Arts and Crafts. Day. Yeah, it was there. And they're like little pipe cleaner looking guys. <laughs> I guess that was that was their true form. And oh, they're dying. Yeah. Oh, that's a shame. They're kind of cool. So fi- uh, non-humanoids, rare. Yeah. Rare, but we're seeing some more non-humanoids. So what did we have? We had the Horda. Mm-hmm. We had the Flying Omelets. Yeah. And these guys. Mm-hmm. They kind of look like little pipe cleaner shrimps or something. Yeah, oh, well, too late. They're dead. Oh, man. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Oh, well. And we could have studied them. Yeah. Prime directive. Yeah. Uh, and, but they did claim the life of one crew member. Yeah. Jackson. It's <sighs> a shame. Yeah. Well. Get one final shot. And, man, this is it. This is the... The end of Cat's Paw. My uh, my cat is um, comfortably asleep at this point. I guess after uh, after the cat had its uh, its final uh, appearance, uh, he mm. lost interest. Yeah. So uh, essential get, voting. Yeah, um, I'll go if you want. Sure. Um, as much as I sort of enjoyed this episode, especially after learning uh, that it was pretty much intended to be a Halloween episode, a a very rare holiday themed episode of Star Trek. Um, There's just nothing on display here um, that we, we don't see anywhere else to make this essential for me. And I don't think um, it's that well known enough to really sort of fall into that cocktail party rule um, especially considering that I can't remember seeing this episode since, you know, like the mid nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, so as much as I'd like to find a way to maybe squeeze this through, um, I just can't vote it, uh, anything but non-essential. Yeah, me neither. So the holiday episode thing is cool. That's a really cool footnote. And I think it's cool to see Chekhov's wig as his first production appearance. I think that's really great. And of course, it's the first production episode to have all seven characters in it, which is cool too. But uh, I I don't think any of that really adds up necessarily to it being an essential episode. But if, if we could create a, 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 another category to say what episodes are not essential, but meh, they're kind of fun to watch for this reason or that reason. They don't necessarily fit into that essential mold, but uh, if you have some extra time, throw your eyes on it just as a goof. Yeah, you know what? And and I'd imagine that when we're done with the entire series, um, that's something we could go back and do maybe in like our season three um, look back. We could devote a portion of that to looking back to all three seasons and sort of cherry picking you know, some of those fun episodes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So it looks like a double non-essential vote on Cat's Paw. And uh, we're going to be back again next week with I Mud, the second Harry Mud episode. And as always, if you want to catch up with us on social media, we are available on Twitter at TTT underscore pod and Facebook.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions. We also have a website, the Tricorder Transmissions.com. A lot of buzz has been generated about the series. NBC seemed proud of it, given the fact that it had been nominated for five Emmy Awards. Dr. Isaac Asimov called it the first good television science fiction show. Large volumes of fan mail kept pouring in at NBC. The only other show to receive more fan mail was The Monkees. Now, that brings me to a behind-the-scenes story. It was often cited that the reason for adding Ensign Pavel Chekhov in the series' second season was this. The Russian newspaper Pravda took umbrage at the fact that Star Trek, a show about space exploration, did not have a Russian aboard. After all, wasn't Russia the first country to venture into outer space? But it was in direct response to the monkey's popularity 
that the Chekhov character, played by Walter Koenig, was added to the crew. Chekhov was meant to be a Davy Jones look-alike, and it was the network's hope that he would appeal to the teens and young adults who were watching the monkeys. It wouldn't be the last time that NBC monkeyed around with Star Trek.